Well, speaking of terrible, um, but I said I was going to try to help some people. I don't know, it may be too late for these particular people, but maybe, maybe somebody's coming down the pipeline that could benefit from this information. The main event was for the TNT title, Powerhouse Hobbs against Wardlow, Falls Count Anywhere, no DQ, no rules, lazy booking. <sighs> They're both green. We've talked about this, and this handicaps them even further and increases the injury risk. They're never going to learn when you have them doing nothing but garbage matches. And again, yeah, Hobbs has been there for three years, but let's just say that, now let's go crazy, let's say six months ago, they suddenly decided, oh my God, we've got this fucking guy. Looks like a million dollars, still in his early 30s, obviously motivated to be better, great backstory, let's use him, right? Is it a stretch to think that if you have a wrestling company, regardless of what kind of wrestling you like, if you have a wrestling company and you got a guy like Hobbs on the roster, the Hobbs of six months ago, you would say, yeah, let's try to develop him, wouldn't you? Is that controversial? No, I don't think it's controversial. Okay. And Wardlow. You've got a guy like Wardlow that already had gotten over by six months ago to a, a, a big level. The people were loving the Powerbomb Symphony and loving his explosiveness. It was being analogies or similarities were being drawn to Goldberg. He, right? was, the most the over, he was the most over babyface in the company for a time. Okay. So it's not unreasonable to think with the people screaming for this guy that even though he's green and he's older than he looks, that we should probably try to spend some time and effort in developing him, right? That's not controversy. Not at all. Okay. Then now, six months later, instead of doing what they've just done to each of these guys, instead of Wardlow having a goddamn long-running program with a fake lawyer and the security, and then somehow Samoa Joe becoming his tag team partner for six weeks so that he could turn heel on him and cut his fucking hair off and emasculate him. Meanwhile, Hobbs is mad for a variety of reasons that we're not completely sure of all of them at both of these fucking guys, and now they're just beating each other up each week on television. What if instead you had said, okay, I've got Hobbs and I've got Wardlow, and it's six months ago. So I'm going to give them both the same agent, the same whatever their agent, producer, whatever they're calling these days, one of the veterans that they have supposedly agenting, producing, setting up these matches. I've, I've seen Pat Buck on camera. I've seen Jerry Lynn on camera. I've said, who else have I seen? B.J. Whitmer. Hey, Steel. Um, oh, well... <laughs> A steel ain't there no more, unfortunately. Point being, some I, of those names that I mentioned, I don't know their whole roster, but I would pick Jerry Lynn because he got 35 years of experience. And Jerry Lynn was a brilliant underdog, kind of baby face, smaller guy, fight from underneath, blah, blah, blah. He would know how a big guy works. So you give Jerry Lynn, Hobbs, and Wardlow to teach them how big men work. You would teach Hobbs the aggression and how to stay on guys and how to make all of your shit look good. I will illustrate here in a second with some things that he's doing, that he's taking shortcuts. You would, with Wardlow, as a baby, Hobbs would be a heel, obviously, so you're teaching him aggression and staying on guys, but how to work with a guy to his level. In other words, if you're with a job guy, you give them almost nothing. If you're with a middle-level guy, you give them a little something. If you're with a top guy, you give them the most. Psychology things. You would work on vignettes like they started doing. Did one. You made the monster. Him working out. He saw his brother murdered in front of him. He's, maybe he's antisocial. Let's flesh that out. You would have that producer on, in charge of his vignettes, his matches, and his training and you would put this guy on tv twice a month once every three weeks for six months 
getting wins in four to five minutes convincingly with his finish, and on weeks he wasn't on television, you might have 45 seconds to a minute of him speaking. He's not in a program he doesn't need to be because he's ha establishing his presence in the company and talking about what he wants to achieve while he's beating people. With Wardlow, it's different, but still the same concept. He's a babyface. His producer would teach him not to do these flips and these outrageous athletic movements that he does against job guys or for no reason or out of nowhere. You would build to it. It would be done in pay-per-view matches or in bigger matches or against more important opponents or just every once in a while. But more important, you would concentrate on him going on the win streak with the Powerbomb Symphony. Every two or three weeks for six months, he would be on television winning in a minute with the Powerbomb Symphony over everybody that's put in front of him. If he shouldn't beat him in a minute, they ain't put in front of him. But he's at the same time training mentally and psychologically on when to do his big athletic moves and when just to be a dominant physical beast. And he's the one who gets pockets his win streak, or maybe Jane Cargill's win streak. Because Goldberg was 50-something and zero before they even started fucking gimmicking it and killing that off because people knew it wasn't real. So then you're talking about, my God, everybody wants to see Wardlow against bigger and better competition. We can't find opponents for Wardlow. Nobody wants to go in there and take a chance on, you know, being a part of the Powerbomb Symphony. He's he's not an established name, ladies and gentlemen, so the champions and the veterans, they don't want to get in there and be beat by a relative newcomer unknown. So we're having a hard time getting people in the ring with this motherfucker. That's the way you sell that. And then, eventually, both of them getting over. One's a face and one's a heel. And they neither one have a title belt because neither one needs it. And you do that and you make sure that in their training, they're understanding that this is the way to get them over. But then they are training to have competitive matches where they can still take care of themselves and their personas and their gimmick. And then when it's finally time, six months later, then you have the irresistible force and the immovable object. that One of them ends up with a title belt that the other one wants. And then they've never touched. They've never even been in the same universe until it's time. And then you have them work out behind the scenes together for a week or two before their first match or first long or substantive physical confrontation so that they know exactly what they're going to do when to make the fucking point. And then you might have a program. Or you can do this. You can book the fucking first match to be for the title and make it street fight, no DQ, no time limit, falls count anywhere, anything goes, no rules. And they started the match in the parking garage where they were trying to slam each other's heads in the car doors. And Hobbs took a backdrop through a windshield, legitimately. Before the bell even rang. Then they rang the bell right before a vertical suplex on a fucking car hood. And they do 90 seconds of action in the parking garage, and the break spot is Wardlow after a backdrop through a windshield and a suplex on a car hood. Wardlow hits Hobbs with a plastic drink pallet. And they go to the break. And they made these guys street fight through the break in the back of the building in a picture-in-picture -picture box that's only 18 inches diagonal on my 72-inch screen and no audio. So for most people watching a television, they're in a little box with the audio of, oh, get your fucking condoms and goddamn anal lube today at Walgreens. And when they come back to the full program, 
they're doing the deal where they hold each other lightly and power walk through the arena to get to the ring, like Bruiser Brody and Abdullah in Japan in 88. They'll just walk, They'll just lay hands on each other and walk through the crowd. And both of them immediately get in the fucking ring and no-sell each other's spine busters. Well, that was fucking brilliant. What did you, either one of you, hope to accomplish by that? And who was the goddamn agent? Maybe you didn't tell him you were going to do it. I don't know. But that's brilliant to, to not sell either guy's spine buster. It doesn't make you look big and bad. It makes the other guy look fucking shitty. Both of you. Because anything that you, either one of you, the way you look, do to the other guy, he should register, he should sell, it should hurt. I don't care how big he is. We're talking about fucking trains colliding here. There's going to be some fucking damage. And then they do the one-two in the ring, and Wardlow's punches are shit. And their trade was blah. It needs to be big. They were trading like lightweights. It was too fast. There was no registering and selling. There was no body language. You draw back and you swing from the fences and you swing for the fences. Bam! And the other guy fucking registers it and rocks back and comes back from downtown. Bam! Oh, shit. Anything these guys do needs to be bigger, not the same or smaller. And at that point, the fans, there was no pop. When, when Wardlow also, the F-10, don't rip off the name of your finish, especially if you're a babyface from the biggest goddamn star in the business, because then that just calls attention to him. Wardlow hits his F-10 and gets a two count, and there's no pop. Because everybody knew that's not the finish. They didn't sell a spine buster or whatever the fuck. And then the fans started chanting, we want tables. So there's two supposed top stars in the ring, and the fans are chanting for the furniture. Because all they're looking at is a stunt show. This was not made to mean anything. It was a disservice to these guys, and these guys are both so green, they may not even realize that this booking is goddamn rotten and abysmal, and that they don't know what they're doing, and nobody's apparently telling them if they are telling them and nobody's listening. So then Hobbs, Wardlow goes to powerbomb him, and Hobbs slips out by going over Wardlow's back, but instead of landing on his feet, he stumbles and goes down to his knees because he's 300 fucking pounds. And he awkwardly went into the spot they were trying. They should have worked the whole match on can Wardlow get Hobbs up to powerbomb him. Because it's not just the weight, it's weight that's fighting back. And instead, not only did they establish they can spine buster each other with no problem and neither one's going to fucking be hurt by it, but then Wardlow establishes that he can pick Hobbs up for the powerbomb anytime he wants, but Hobbs, doing a Rey Mysterio spot, goes over his back and slips down to his feet and falls and looks like a stumble bump because they shouldn't have been doing that to begin with. That's for 180-pound people. And then Hobbs, the spot was that Hobbs was going to shove Wardlow off into the ropes, just a double-hand shove, and he caught him coming off with a spine buster again. A, why it didn't phase him before, and B, you're going to drop behind the guy, turn around, do a double-handed shove. This other 300-pound guy is going to fly backwards 10 feet, come back off the ropes and into your spine buster because he's out of control from that? What the fuck? These guys need to be in goddamn class. And he... And then he fucking followed the second spine buster up that, by the way, they sold that one. Wardlow sold that one. And then he grabbed Wardlow's leg and rolled him over and pushed him to the ropes again, double hand shove, and get him a second spine buster. It's, fuck, it's not even laziness. He's not trying to be lazy. It's just lost opportunity. Hobbs, you're wasting the idea. Don't just lackadaisically push him backwards into the ropes. If you're going to do, and if you're going to do two spine busters, especially after a motherfucker didn't sell your first one, do three in a row, the three amigos. And if you're going to do a series, make it count. 
you either shoot him off to the ropes hard with all you've got, or you reverse an arm whip and you shoot him off hard and you catch him and you plant him with a spine buster. And then you pop up and grab that leg and roll him up by the leg and grab the fucking left arm and shoot him off hard from the middle of the ring. Don't back him up. Keep him going. He's off balance. And you hit him with a second one. Boom. And he lands and he turns over on his hands and knees and he's holding his ribs and there you can hook him in a front face lock and pull him up to his feet and shoot him again by his arm hard but five or six feet to the ropes where you don't even have to let go of him and jerk him back into your fucking bear hug and hit a third spine buster. Boom! And then you go for the fucking cover. Hook the one leg, one, two, and he either kicks out if he's goddamn still should be in that good a condition or he gets his leg on the fucking ropes and breaks the fucking count but that's explosiveness and aggression and physicality that you could have uncorked and done the same thing you just did by wandering through it and being awkward and shoving guys around that they shouldn't go where you're fucking shoving them And then they went to the floor and Hobbs pulls a table out. And while he's setting it up and finding the table, setting it up and putting it in the right place, he lets Wardlow recover for no apparent reason. Because he could have just kept on the fucking guy that he was beating up, but instead he let him go so he could go find a table. Because the people are chanting for furniture anyway. Furniture is the most important talent on the roster. And then he puts Hobbs... Um, or no, I'm sorry, Wardlow obviously recovers and puts Hobbs on the table that Hobbs just set up and got on the top rope and did a swanton and swantoned Hobbs through the table, off the top rope, through to the floor for a two count. Jesus, it looked great. It looked great. So why do it and then go two more minutes and lose, you moron? So it wasn't the finish or it wasn't the thing that foiled the baby face. It was just a spot. High injury risk and nobody will give a shit because it didn't play a part in the decision of the match. So then Wardlow power bombs Hobbs on the floor and both of them are down for a while and then they get up and go up to the stage and Wardlow's going to try to power bomb Hobbs off the stage. By the way, Wardlow the baby face. And suddenly, QT Marshall shows up and hits Wardlow in the back with a chair. And Wardlow no-sells it, turns around and grabs him by the goozle pipe. And then QT kicks Wardlow in the balls and down he drops. <laughs> and QT has a chair and Wardlow's there holding his nuts looking at him and he fucking hits him, whacks him with the chair. And then I think he hit him a second time. And then QT goes over and picks Hobbs up, because now Hobbs is just a piece of shit laying around. Picks him up, and then thanks to QT, they both powerbomb Wardlow off the stage into the crash pad pit. Which, by the way, they've changed their structure. It didn't go poof. It was covered up with balsa wood instead of a sheet. And I don't think it was air inflated. I believe they moved up styrofoam, if I had to guess. And then Wardlow was counted down for the 10 count in a Falls Count Anywhere match. And Hobbs is the new champion because of QT Marshall, who has been presented as a feckless, ineffectual comedy job figure for the entire run of the promotion, and suddenly comes out there and single-handedly helps his little buddy, powerhouse Hobbs, beat the big bad Wardlow for the belt. This was the worst way possible to put the belt on Hobbs or to have Hobbs fucking win. And you can't tell me that they couldn't have made some, something out of Wardlow missing that goddamn swanton through the table and Hobbs pinning him there and give Wardlow an out instead of just this disgusting heat kind of finish that gets heat on the promotion for its goofiness. And nobody gives a shit about QT. And this is coming from somebody who saw a bright future for him about 15 years ago. 
And and Hobbs, it just becomes a fucking flunky. Yeah, is is this is he now going to be Hobbs's manager? So they think that that is a, a, I I don't. I honestly don't know how the fuck, unless QT Marshall had pictures or documentation that Tony Khan has been doing business with the Sandinistan terrorists, that this would be allowed to happen. Your thoughts? I mean, there's so much to talk about here. Again, this was a horrible follow-up to the pay-per-view. The pay-per-view was the first positive thing to happen to Wardlow in a while. That's out the window now. He's lost again. Oh, someone cheated to help Hobbs. Yeah, but it was QT Marshall. You said he's been treated like a job figure since the beginning. No, he was also treated like a philanderer for a few weeks, and then <laughs> his wife was on TV. Remember that? That's right. He was a philanthropist or philanderer or philatelist or whatever. But he had the faction. or Not the faction. What were their names? Uh, the fact. No, they the weren't factory. the factory. The factory. They were the factory. He had the factory. They tried to do things with... Cody and Agogo. That's years ago at this point. Nothing's been going on. We've seen QT do plenty of promos. He's fine for a Mark Sterling. He's not someone who should be the mouthpiece for a Will Hobbs or whoever the monster heel that they're trying to do something with. As soon as you have QT as the manager, the monster loses steam. We've seen him on TV. We know who he is. Ward looks like a jerk off. That advice you gave him months ago about calling WWE? 203. No, stop, stop, well, stop, I, stop. I, actually, I, I, can't, I can't give him Laurinaitis' number anymore. But the point is, that isn't even a joke anymore. And I don't even know if they would see him the same way they saw him months ago. Look at the way all this has been handled. This is how this show ended. For no good reason, a street fight. After the TNT champion allegedly had his gear and his belt stolen. There was a brand new belt there ready to go days later. And then a street fight with a bad crash pad. You didn't even talk about how bad it looked. It was, a, it was more obvious to but me. I think, I think balsa wood over styrofoam sounds kind of like a fucking Mickey Mouse operation. I'm sorry I didn't do it justice. It was worse than the Jericho crash pad. I'll put it that way. And there was no high distance to come from. So I don't, I don't know. I think, I think it's worse when they bounce and, and the thing goes poof and they bounce rather than well, when it just, you know, it's obviously I forgot some about type that. of cushioned material. I forgot about the bounce. Yeah. The bouncy house. This was a horrible end to a horrible show. They've treated Wardlow. They booked Wardlow into the ground because Tony doesn't know how to book. They have misused Hobbs for a long time because Tony doesn't know how to book. QT is back on the show. Because Tony likes him, and Tony doesn't know how to book. This show's been falling apart lately because Tony doesn't know how to book. More and more people... But what do you think the real reason for their dire situation is? The real reason for the dire situation is Tony Khan thinks he could book. And Tony Khan thinks he's good at this. Tony Khan thinks he has this. And... I have a tough time believing that anyone who deals with him on a regular basis, and I know a few thinks that he is good at this. He's got the money to do it, but he is showing on a weekly basis that he does not know how to format or how to put together a good wrestling television show. Again, there's a ninny audience that just wants to see their favorites have matches where nothing matters. Did, did, did you say a mini audience or a ninny audience? A ninny audience. They may be a mini <laughs> audience too that wants that kind of wrestling. But if that's what you're catering to, you see what you're going to get. And this was another miserable show.